Welcome to the Everyone's a Critic Movie Review Podcast. I'm your co-host, Bob Zerl. With me, as always, is professional film critic, Sean Patrick. Visit us at IHateCritics.net, Everyone's a Critic Podcast.com, or on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Our handle is CriticsPod. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Alexa, all your podcatchers. Please write and review the show. Give us a five-star review. We'll read your review on the air. And if you do so, let us know about it. We have a giveaway on our social media pages. They're pinned to the top. Uh, is there anything more you need to say about that one, Sean? Or No, I'll just give you a Blu-ray of, a, of an uh, Asian movie. Yes. Uh, and they're great movies, too. So uh, you'll really enjoy them. Uh, and that's if you give us a five-star review on any of the platforms, but you need to let us know. And then you can hit us up on the platforms or email us at critics at IHateCritics.net. Uh, we are- and uh, also, just quickly, thank you to WellGo USA for making it possible for us to have uh, each of these titles. The titles, which I don't have in front of me right now, but uh, they're all uh, basically just Asian films. Yes. Uh, we're on YouTube. Uh, record live. There'll be a notice on our social media pages there if you want to watch us. Or you can subscribe to the YouTube page as well. We're on patreon.com slash critics pods. The best would help support the podcast. And then our T public page is over at I hate critics.net. If you click on the T public link or search critics pod at T public. All right, let's get the pictures up for our YouTube listeners and start the show. And we will start with the suicide squad. The Suicide Squad is another take on uh, DC's uh, team of uh, supervillains, so this time from the director James Gunn, best known for uh, the Guardians of the Galaxy series, and uh, what he did amazing things with that. And uh, here he's trying to bring some of that uh, Guardians of the Galaxy energy to this Suicide Squad thing, and it just it doesn't work. I, I thought I didn't know how much I really didn't like this movie until I actually sat down to, uh, to write about it. And I realized that as as I started to write about it, like as much as I did laugh during this movie, the there's a certain emptiness to the storytelling here that that is inescapable when you sit down to actually think of it. Like as an experience, as it's happening, it's fine. And I'm sure there are pop, probably many people who are watching right now or listening right now thinking, well, that, you know, I enjoyed it while it was on. I'm sure you did. Uh, try thinking of it right now and remember something that was funny. <laughs> and, and I know probably many of you can do that, but I can't. I couldn't. When I sat down to actually uh, do it, I tried to think of the things that actually really did make me laugh and, and you know, stood out to me. And they're all Margot Robbie moments from uh, from her, you know, this brief section right in the middle of the movie that centers entirely on Harley Quinn. That is a very funny, very inventive segment that is very much in the style of uh, what we know of James Gunn. Uh, but everything else, especially the John Cena stuff, is incredibly forced. And and uh, Cena, especially, I love Cena, and he's doing his he's doing his best here. But I think he's really, I think he's really overmatched by the amount of things that they have him do. And I think that's element that that is in the trailer. Uh, there's an element right there in the trailer that that demonstrates that this uh, beach full of penises that he promises he would eat on behalf of freedom. That joke is so long, and, and I and I get the part of the joke is how long it is to get for him to get through it, but you can just sense the struggle. Like that had to be take fifty three or something. Like the number of times that he had to do that to get it right. Uh, you can just sense the strain, and then. I, I don't know why they decided to cast Idris Elba in the lead of this. I lo- I think Idris Elba is is a great TV actor, uh, but in, in movies thus far, I've not been impressed by I've not been impressed by him since Pacific Rim. If I'm being completely honest, and here, I mean, putting him in a role like of a character named Bloodsport, whose main attributes are that he's really good with weapons. After we've just had Will Smith who is super charismatic, who is a complete movie star playing a character named Deadshot, who's really good with weapons. It, it doesn't even as even as bad as this as Suicide Squad was that first Suicide Squad in 2016. Will Smith is still a better, more charismatic leading man than Idris Elba is. And and so he's kind of in that shadow regardless of what he does, uh, because the characters are too similar. Um. So yeah, Margot Robbie is great. I really liked her. I really liked what uh, Harley Quinn does in the movie. Um, the shark character, uh, I think Stallone it does a great job uh, with his, uh, you know, with the voicing of that character. 
the polka dot guy is a, is completely wasted, useless character uh, that uh, is just I don't know why he was there. And then, of course, they've got this opening parody uh, set of Suicide Squad characters, uh, uh, people played by uh, 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 Flula Borg and uh, several other My, R- Michael Rooker Pete is Davidson. in that. And, yeah. And Pete Davidson, you're right. And uh, Nathan Fillion. And they're ju- that's just this useless parody of the notion of Suicide Squad that is never funny for one second. Like there is there are zero laughs to be had from any of that. And I'm not even I'm just not even sure why that was even included. Uh, it's just in, in, in this insanely unfunny series of scenes. Um, I, I I don't know. I Like I said, I, I, I thought while I was watching that I was kind of kind of enjoying it. I think part of that just had to do with how much I really liked the Harley Quinn sequence in the middle. But beyond that, uh, you know, Joel Kinnaman is boring. Uh the the young woman who plays Ratcatcher two that character isn't particularly interesting. Uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm just suddenly I realized as, as I was writing about it, like this is a very empty experience. Yeah, and I, I mean, I get what he was going for in that opening sequence. You know, it's shocking you're killing off known actors. I mean, not hugely known, but people we recognize. Uh, so and people who've been doing press, you know. So it's you know, I get it. But it wasn't shocking enough for me. And then I, I just thought the chemistry between Cena and Idris Elba wasn't great. Uh, and I don't blame them. I blame uh, James Gunn. I it's I, I I could see the stuff playing funny while they're writing it or even while they're messing around on set. But the way he captured it just didn't work. And I it, it really was disappointing. I didn't I didn't even enjoy it while I was watching it. Other than again, you're right, Harley Margot Robbie in all three of these movies has been the standout star, which is why she keeps coming back. Yeah. Uh I just in some ways I'm more disappointed by this one because James Gunn had more control than uh Ayers had. Yeah. And I, I you know and I think what's good about that is better than what's good about this one obviously this plays better as a movie but i i I don't know i I feel like david ayers his career hasn't been the same since that i don't think it's fair because he had his legs cut from underneath him and i just don't but and then i look around and see this getting amazing reviews right and left and i just don't get it i mean other than margot robbie being really impressive and even if you watch the press i mean john cena's funny on the talk shows doing what he's doing it just didn't translate to this movie, for me at least. No, I'm with you. It didn't. It didn't translate for me either. Like I found him more awkward than funny, and I get that the character is supposed to be awkward, uh, but I still, <laughs> I don't think it. It didn't translate to funny awkward. It translated almost to cringe for me. Right, and not the good kind. Yeah, it was yeah. just not. I feel bad because I, I feel like I'm missing something, but. Maybe I don't. We're probably not, and, and it's frustrating too because the Guardians movies are so entertaining, uh, and this is just Guardians light and very light with Margot Robbie <laughs> being awesome. I mean that scene where she unlocks her, you know, locks herself from the lock. She actually did that. And it's really cool, you know. It, now it looks like a stunt double because the way he shot it. <laughs> <laughs> But it's a neat scene, and you're, the whole middle yeah. part with her is great. The whole the character itself is amazing, and she's knocked it out of the park since the beginning. Uh, I don't know. I, I here we have a movie that's building up to an ending that is supposed to be just this most outlandish thing in the world. We've got it. I don't know if this is a spoiler or not. There's a giant starfish in this movie, and this should be like we should be building to something the film should feel like it's it's rolling towards this you know big giant absurd moment of a of a large sentient uh, you know starfish and it doesn't feel like anything at the end it just by that time it, it's a, it's exhausting by that point and you just you, you just want it to be over and then of course if you don't have main character powers you get turned into this starfish zombie things but if you have main character powers you're fine <laughs> well, yeah, and even the character that killed off isn't all the way dead. And so it's like even that is weak. 
Uh, and you look at the Guardians movies, and they don't have the best endings, but they're funny enough because of the way you set up your characters. And then they they just like one of them. They don't they like dance to end the movie. There's some sort That's of that's the dance. first one. Yeah. yeah. The second it, one's got a really kind of emotional ending, really. You're right. But the first one, this is more in line with because the starfish is stupid. It's <laughs> stupid looking. It's not funny. I think they're trying to be funny. Even the line about the starfish and the butthole it just sounds like a forced joke early on. Again, by Cena. James Gunn wrote it. Uh, I don't know. I just. it, it be, <sighs> Maybe this could have worked as a Guardians movie. But this is supposed to be a darker, more violent movie, and it's gory, mainly at the beginning, but not. And that's that's another thing. Yes, that's a, that's a good point. Is that it is incredibly violent at the beginning, and when you start off that hot, you've got nowhere left to go now. So now the next deaths aren't going to be as impactful because you just you know you blew a guy up uh, after he threw his detachable arms at people, or you you, know, you cut this guy in half, or you. You know, you filled Jay, Jay Courtney's character, who was supposed to be like, I guess, a kind of, well, he was in the original. So, I mean, you one of those holdovers, it's like you know, blown up, like just burned alive. So, I mean, that's supposed to be shocking. But when you start off at that high a level of gore and violence, where do you go from there? Like you, you've already, you've already spent all of your bullets and now you've got to, now you've got to circle back around and try and shock us again. And, and really it's more exhausting than it is exciting. The only thing you could have done is kill Harley Quinn and we don't want that. <laughs> you yeah. Know? So it, I don't know, but again, everybody else loves it. So, uh, I don't know. I actually like this next movie better, and I don't even really like this next movie. Oh, that's not it. Where's Jungle, <laughs> Jungle Cruise? Is in here somewhere? Where's Jungle Cruise? All right, Jungle Cruise somehow didn't make my cut. So let's just talk about Jungle Cruise real quick. Oh yeah, okay. Uh, Jungle Cruise stars uh, Dwayne the Rock Johnson and uh, Emily Blunt in a story based off of a uh, Disney ride. Uh, it tells the story of a. A uh, guy running a jungle cruise and a woman who wants to uh, use his jungle cruise to get to this secret tree and some uh, ancient uh, uh, jungle that has uh, healing powers. And this is a this is a movie that exists. That's what I that's basically my main takeaway. This this exists. This is a thing that is in the world and it has no positive or negative value to me whatsoever. I, it is the equivalent of watching a blank screen for the same amount of time. I had the same, would have the same amount to say about it. It, it's not a bad movie. It's not a good movie. It exists to me. And I, I didn't laugh. I wasn't annoyed. There's a level of professionalism involved. Uh, I like Dwayne Johnson and Emily Blunt. I don't buy Dwayne Johnson and Emily Blunt, but I, I enjoy them as human beings. Maybe not as much as these characters, because again, these characters are, are characters we've seen in any dozen movies similar to this. Uh, and, and the thing about it is, is that th this it, this is basically it feels like a Pirates of the Caribbean movie uh, because it's very similar, but it doesn't have Johnny Depp. And what and what it underlines is that what Johnny Depp brought to Pirates of the Caribbean was this unpredictable anarchic spirit that takes this very conventional thing and makes it something else. And that's not who Emily Blunt and Dwayne Johnson are. They're not those anarchic elements that can turn something from what it is into something that it's wasn't supposed to be or what is it expected to be. Uh, Depp was constantly completely unpredictable and weird and funny and they're playing this entirely straight. And as they play this material entirely straight, it's not very interesting. Yeah, I, I agree. It's the fact that you or me or anybody who, if you like rock and Emily Blunt, it, it's just watchable enough to get through, but it kind of begins and ends there. And it's not because the characters, just because you like them as people or actors, uh, which is the only reason I prefer to wear Suicide Squad because I'll take <laughs> those two over Cena and <laughs> Andrew Selva. Uh, That's your SummerSlam main event, and you're taking. You're right. taking I mean that now you got the Margot Robbie again. She's so good in that role, but it's just yeah. Other than Birds of Prey, there hasn't really been a great movie yet, and that's I don't know if it's great. It's good. It's very good, uh, but I just uh, I. 
But yeah, Jungle Cruise is you're okay if you missed it. Uh, yeah, you're not missing anything. It's it's not an essential movie. It's barely a movie. It just it like I said, it's a thing that exists in the world. <laughs> yeah. All right, still water. Still water. Another thing that unfortunately exists in the world. Uh, <laughs> it's a movie starring uh, Matt Damon as a, a man from Oklahoma who travels to uh, uh, to. Uh, France, because his daughter is in jail there. She has been in jail for uh, several years at the time we joined the story. And uh, it's because several years earlier, she was accused of and found guilty of killing her uh, roommate, who was also apparently her uh, her lover. Uh, the father goes to France to visit her, ends up uh, spending more time and begins to invest himself sort of in, invest- in a new investigation of what happened. Uh, there's essentially a new lead uh, potentially that may lead to, to this person that may have actually committed the murder. And there are basically two movies going on here. There's one with him and his daughter. And then there's another story where he's uh, becoming part of this uh, French family with this uh, woman who takes him in. Uh, he becomes kind of a surrogate to her, to her daughter. Uh, and he, over a p- period of about a year of him living there, he moves in and there begins to be a romance there it's kind of interesting, but at the same time, it's kind of also very distracting. And and the movie just is divided in these two very different stories that neither of which has much time on top of which uh, the, this is based off of, I mean, loosely based off of ripping off of the Amanda Knox story and really just, uh, just takes nothing important or interesting away from that story. Because the fact was that she was completely innocent and this movie is playing with the notion of being innocent or not, in, or not innocent. And it's really it, that element bugged me. Cause I'm, a, I'm big on this story, like the, of how badly treated she was. And Tom McCarthy admitted that he did base this on her without ever speaking to her. And it's not like you can deny it. <laughs> There's no oh, yeah. other precedent for what he for the story that he's telling here. Um, this is a movie that wants to also kind of maybe mix in some uh, some uh, both sides sort of politics to it, uh, which is weird and not necessary. Uh, Damon's great. At, Damon's great in this movie. I mean, he's a he's a tremendous actor. I just I just don't think there's enough focus. I don't think this movie has enough energy or life to it. Uh, to to really gain any interest either way, I think I was slightly more interested in the romantic plot because it's they're two such different people, and you're kind of seeing him grow as a person in that role, whereas he's kind of stays the same guy in the other part of the movie. Uh, overall, I, I just find this movie desperately mixed to negative for the most part. Yeah, I'm of this is one of those of two minds. I, I as a movie, I thought it was very good. I actually like the way they intertwine the two stories. Uh, I took my kids to it. They actually liked it because I couldn't find my daughter and wanted to go and I couldn't leave my son home alone. Uh, So they both actually liked it quite a bit. What bugs me is, one, we've watched two pretty original movies we're going to get to later on, which when you have that the same week you watch a very straightforward movie, it's not fair to this movie. Uh but then there's the Amanda Knox thing. It's it's just not fair to her, and it's not. It's not you know, you're inspired by what you're inspired by. You want to make a movie, and I get it. But you know, for the rest of her life, she's going to have people questioning whether she did it or not. And now you got a movie. They're using her name in press, like you mentioned. He admitted to it. They're not doing yeah. it every time they talk, but they're doing it enough to sell the movie. And that's not, I mean, that's just not fair. And, I mean, there are other examples, but this one is specific to what Amanda Knox was accused of. I mean, there's, you know, there's been Americans that got arrested and stuff. You know, we had to try to get them back, but not like, I mean, this was like roommate, the, a sex cult thing they're trying to play off. Uh, yeah. Literally everything that happened in her case happened here was just in a different spot, and the dad didn't. Right, right down to even the guy who they think actually did it, right. accusing her of hiring him to do it. Like that is something that even came up in the trial of the guy who actually killed Amanda Knox's roommate. Right, and then fully false, by the way, fully false, totally made up on his part. But in this movie, it's not. <laughs> 
Right. And that's what's uh, just it's intended to create drama here, which, again, is irresponsible. It just yeah, it, it's if this were a wholly original idea, I think it works. You know, it, it does create drama. But the fact that the story exists, it's I don't know. And, it's and there's an entirely irresponsible ending on top of it. Right. It just it, it's a it just kind of bummed me out. Uh, but you're right. Matt Damon is really, really good in this. One of his better performances, and it's just kind of a shame it's in this movie. I mean, he's I've always liked him, but man, he just says stupid shit sometimes. <laughs> Did you hear what he just came out with about a week ago? Uh, that his child taught him not to say uh, just recently taught him not to say a gay slur. Yeah, like within the last, like this year. <laughs> it's like really. <laughs> And it just yeah, was, that was a tough that was a tough one to try and retcon after that. You can't put that genie back in the bottle, right? <laughs> he, you know, it, I, it was uh, an interesting note. I was talking to one of the movie theater managers after I saw the movie, and they they were telling me about how a guy walked out of Stillwater. and goes, uh, "Why that you promised the Matt, that they said that Matt Damon's supposed to be in that movie? I didn't see Matt Damon at all." Oh my god. <laughs> Well, that's the other thing is I heard Matt Damon on a couple of podcasts. He's worried about the way they're marketing it because they're halfway marketing it like a Liam Neeson movie, like he's going to an action film. Yeah, that does. Yeah. I mean, that's- they're not totally going there, but he's definitely on every podcast I've heard him on. He's kind of said, this isn't that movie. I love those movies, but this is not that movie. <laughs> uh, so There are elements of that movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess there's a, but it's not heightened, you know. It's yeah, and I, I, that scene in the at the soccer game match or whatever, that's believable and it's scary, and you're just like you're frustrated, you're like don't do that, don't do that. That's a great scene, a great couple scenes, but it's still not. A, it, it just there's so much outside of the movie that's that pulls me out of it that. I just wish they wouldn't have done, and irresponsible is a great word. Uh, it just bums me out that they did it, and, and, it, and it affects my opinion of the movie because of it, and they should have yeah, done I'm with better. You. They really should have. It's it's really terrible, and, and just, would you please, I'm begging people to just listen to Amanda Knox for a couple of minutes, because she, she's talked about this, and, and what she's, she's not whining, she's right. <laughs> People are accusing her of whining about this. And you just you're just wrong. Just go actually take a look at this case. Uh, the way that pop culture has treated her is so shitty. We had, you know, about the time that this was that she was actually like in the middle of this, Lifetime goes and makes a movie basically accusing her of having done it without having any evidence of it. And now you've got a movie like this that uh, that seems to intimate that she was part of doing it too. And it's like that's re- I that's really just in, insanely irresponsible and wrong to somebody who went through a horrific trauma. And I don't think their intent is to do that, but they don't they should know better. It's just like when the Louis CK thing happened and Matt Damon kind of came to his defense. It wasn't that bad. Like come on, you know better. You don't say that, yeah. you know. It's just more that than anything else. I, I again, I their intent I'm sure was not as bad as it came off but you know i don't know you should know better than that and she's not asking for money she just no. doesn't want her name being used all the time uh it, it's just it's really frustrating and or if you're gonna try and tell a story that is basically about her how about talking to her at least how about that <laughs> just give her the courtesy of talking to her they didn't even bother to talk to her yeah white guys <laughs> gotta love them <laughs> <laughs> all right you wanted to also talk about man under the table i have not seen this one yet man under table this is a very interesting one because it's only available via the arrow uh arrows film service their their own personal like streaming service which uh, arrow is a distribution company that makes very low budget movies and uh they acquire older films and they distribute them through via their own platform which is really cool uh, this is a very strange movie about a about a man in Hollywood or in a version of Hollywood that is almost entirely. It looks like cardboard sets and like very fake, and you know, all your extras are are these like cardboard people. 
Uh, and he's a guy who's an industry poser. He's uh, he tells his friend that he's trying to make a movie, and his friend says, "Oh, I actually am making a movie," and it just sets him off on this jealous rage. <laughs> and then over and over again, just things just keep kind of enacting themselves on this guy t- as you know different sorts of humiliations as he tries to go about his life and tries to create something. Uh, you know, tries to get his way into the the Hollywood system, and and it's very it's very funny the the, the various levels of parody at play here just get exponentially more interesting throughout this film. He's got an, he's got a very funny parody of a YouTuber. He's got all these various industry people making you know, the, the, these all speaking this industry jargon about uh, yeah, everybody talks about fracking. Like every, every screenplay has to secretly about be about fracking <laughs> or, or, or identity politics. Fracking and identity politics are in every screenplay. And if you can promise both, you've got a deal. <laughs> like it's, it's really clever. And I, I just, I really adore this movie. And I wanted to call attention to it because I want people to check out Arrow and uh, Arrow's streaming service so they can see this very strange uh, kind of movie and and really give these guys a chance. It's incredibly low budget. Everybody looks like they're you know, dressed in dressed as homeless people. <laughs> But they're all Hollywood people, and uh, like I said, just the whole the whole premise is really really smart and really well played, and I, I just really think this is a very very clever, very underrated movie. That sounds fantastic. Did you watch anything from '91 before we move on? I can't even remember what. The okay, I want I'm just sorry. to run because we're oh. probably going to get into spoiler territory from here on out. But in yeah. 1991, I'll just kind of read off a list of movies. Hot Shots, love it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Doc Hollywood, whatever. Uh, Body Parts, never seen it. Rover Dangerfield, Return to the Blue Lagoon. Bingo, Delirious, Pure Luck, Double Impact. Nothing that's other than Hot Shots that really stood the test of time for me. I think I like I like Doc Hollywood a lot. Um, I'm not sure how well it will hold up. I didn't watch it. Uh, but I, I I really did like that movie a great deal uh, back in you know the the early '90s, and it does have that kind of uh, it does sort of distill the the grown up uh, of uh, Michael J. Fox yeah. uh, charisma, and it's one of the few movies that really outside of the Back to the Future movies where you get to see what people like about uh, about Michael J. Fox. Yeah, I saw it a, maybe in the late '90s. I liked it when I watched it, but it's been forever. And I just never went back to it. Uh, everything else, what I have seen, I never went back to either. Uh, I don't even remember liking Double Impact. So, <laughs> all right. We're going to close with the dud. But anyway, we'll start with John and the Hole. Oh, yes. Uh, John and the Hole. This is uh, from director Pasquale Sisto. And uh, it stars a young man named Charlie Shotwell. And this is a movie that's got a very unique and very daring premise. A 13-year-old boy uh, named John uh, discovers there is a hole in the forest behind his house. It's a, an incomplete bunker that uh, it, there's no way uh, out of it. Uh, it's just a hole in the ground that they didn't complete. And uh, it, this sparks in him this idea to do something that is we're not sure exactly what his motivation for doing it is, but he does it. He takes his entire family, his mother and father and sister, uh, Michael C. Hall, Jennifer Ailey and uh, Thaisa Farmiga and places them in this hole. He puts them unconscious and uh, places them in this hole. And you watch this thing unfold. And it just, it's so such a crazy thought that this, that someone like this could do this, but this kid is so haunting and so convincing that you're just kind of fascinated by him. He begins to, he knows that his mother is, is, is using sleeping pills. So he decides to test the pills and their strength. He tests them on himself. He tests them on a gardener. And once he realizes the, the strength of the amount of sleeping pills he needs to use, that's what he's going to do in order to get his family knocked out enough to be put into this hole. What he plans to do once they're in there, again, he doesn't seem to have a plan. And he's at once calculated. And at the same time, he's a 13-year-old who doesn't understand follow-through. Like, this is all entirely new to him. And you're essentially, you're watching uh, a 13-year-old act his way through sociopathy. And not, a, not realizing, of course, that he's a sociopath. No one else seeing that he's a sociopath 
sociopath, but you're watching those wheels turn as he kind of figures that out. And it is fascinating to watch. This movie is so elegant and so beautiful. And at the same time, so incredibly well observed. It creates this atmosphere of tension that does not lift because you, this child is completely unpredictable. Uh, and his unpredictability uh, combined with this very unique premise uh, just really grabbed me. I was just riveted uh, by this. And I think Pasquale Sisto has a just an amazing eye. I mean, just you can see from this trailer alone just how smart he is with the way he does a visual, this beautiful bucolic setting and these cold, dark cement square around it. it is, that's a fucking great image. And the whole thing is filled with these great images throughout. Uh, there's this game that he plays with a friend where he's they're drowning each other. And this scene is just filled with, with insane amounts of tension because you just John doesn't know where his boundaries are. And so you don't know what's going to happen. And I was just, that happens a number of times. He, at first, he delivers food to his to his family and then he disappears for days and doesn't take them anything. And then he does again. And it's just. The, the way he enacts just making them a meal is creepy and weird. I just think this movie is fantastic. Uh, it's not getting great reviews for whatever reason. I don't get that, but I thought this movie was amazing and we'll get into another part of it in a moment, but I want to get your reaction first uh, from just the, the basics of it. I mean, I love the fact that it exists first and foremost, uh, having, you know, a comic movie, a Disney movie, a very straightforward Hollywood movie, <laughs> This all this week. It, it's plus next we have this A twenty four movie that had kind of a midsummer effect to me. I'm not going to throw it up there with midsummer, but this was a nice something fresh to, that, that I really was glad I got to see. Uh, I love. I just the fact. I mean, sociopaths exist in our everyday life, and some of them they don't even know it. Sometimes, yeah, uh, a lot of them are salespeople. Uh, <laughs> tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> I can't. I can't. Uh, and th- that mixed with this this adolescence that they're trying to, you know, I don't want to say symbolize because it's not that, but it follows basically with that of what you know when you turn to, when you first become an adult. You kind of do the same thing, natural, just not the way, it, you know, not crazy. Uh, it, the way they work it through this kid, and the way they watch him kind of deal with what he's going through is is very fantastic. Uh, the tension is amazing. The and then you don't let's not forget the, the parents and the sister. Their interaction inside the hole, you know, adds another level of tension to the movie. Uh, why are they doing this? And yeah. they're the ones making you th- trying to figure out why. Uh, so I, I absolutely love it. There, This is a movie I could turn on, and I think we'll get to that in a second. Uh, but it would be... The only way I'd turn on it is if... I don't know. We, we'll have to get to it later. It would, take a, it would take a lot for me to do it, but it's not out of the question. Uh but other than that, it's still even if I turn on, I still am glad it exists. I love the originality of it. I love the way it looks. The it, it's just such a beautiful looking movie. So and not in a uh, the way the again. I'm it's hard to not say the Green Knight because we're gonna get to that later because <laughs> that's beautiful too, but in different yeah. ways. Right. Uh, but you're right. The tension is just it's amazing, and I, I don't know from here on out. For the rest of the podcast, be prepared for spoilers. I don't want to have to move stuff around. <laughs> so f- from this and The Green Knight, you're, there's right. probably going to be spoilers here and, here and there. Although the Green Knight's a retelling of a movie so or a story. Uh, but anyway, the three, two, one. anything here is from here forward is spoiler is fair game for spoilers. The, so go ahead. What happen, What happens in this movie is is very... I guess part of this is very controversial, and and I think this is part of what's driven some people to dislike this movie. Mm -hmm. There is a a subplot of of sorts, or is it not a subplot, or is it the framing device? It's hard to say. 
at a certain point after you've been introduced to John and his family and you've begun to see you know something of their lives, we cut away to this other story. A mother is talking to her daughter. Uh, Gail is talking to Lily. And the conversation is very strange. It's very stilted. Uh, the, the daughter is, has been refusing to leave her room. She, uh, uh, her and her mother are kind of not, they're not bickering, but there's a certain weird tension there. Uh, they have this, they have this seemingly sweet conversation. And then she just asks her, her mother to tell her the story of John and the hole. And when she says that we cut to this, uh, title card of John and the hole, and we return to John and his family. And it seems to indicate that the story of John and the hole is that a parable. And whether it is or not, I'm not actually sure, uh, which I know it sounds like that should be something that should really piss me off not being sure. But honestly, I, this movie is so hypnotic. It held me in such in such sway that I didn't get upset about you know, what this means and what this is about because it gets weirder. We return to uh, Gail and Lily later on. Uh, a frantic Gail tells Lily that she is leaving and that Lily is not coming with her, that she is going to leave Lily by herself in this house. Oh, and she's, I've, I've amassed a a hundred thousand dollars. It's in a bag on the bed. It'll sustain you for the next year or so while you figure out what to do with your life, but I'm leaving and you're not coming. And she's nine years old. She's, she's frantic. She doesn't know what to do. She's, she's terrified this poor little girl. And she's very effective at being terrified. My heart was breaking for every moment of that, of that scene. I don't know what, that is intended to mean because it seems to have no relation to the John of the whole story whatsoever. Though I have been thinking about it a lot uh, because I can't stop thinking about this movie in many ways. Uh, There's an element here of religious parable, I believe where we're talking about essentially God uh, leaving, uh, leaving his people to the, to their own devices, like the absence of God, God as a parent, God represented by a parent. Uh, here's a, here's a paradise for you to live in, make of it what you will, but you will feel my absence uh, in within that. And that is pain and despair, the absence of God. Uh, that's just my reading of that one particular part. But again, how that relates to, John and his family. I mean, John essentially is acting as a God, uh, taking control of his family's life in some way. And his absence does cause them to be uh, in pain. And uh, they definitely feel his absence. And even near the end, when the, when he lets them out of the hole, they welcome him back uh, you know, to have that you know, feeling of feeling a wholeness again. Uh, even though essentially, essentially this particular God figure in this case had had abandoned them almost to their peril almost to their death i think there's a there's something there i think but i don't really care if it's there or not because i think this movie just as a movie as an as an as an action of a sort of hitchcockian suspense it is such a modern idea of a thriller and of a suspense movie that I don't really care if there's anything deeper than that, because I think as a filmic exercise, it's so good and so riveting and so beautiful in terms of the, you know, the, the setting and the cinematography, the acting is fantastic. Charlie Shotwell is an incredible young actor who's just, I mean, he's just amazing. He's so haunting. And, uh, and yet like you can't, you can't hate him. He's still like a very much a child, but you're also like, you're horrified by what he's doing and you can't understand what his motivation is. Uh, And so he becomes this figure that is absolutely riveting and you have to have just the right child actor to pull that off. And he pulls it off brilliantly. Um, I, I, I like this movie enough that I don't really care if there's anything deeper than that. Yeah, and I'm. I think you're onto something. I want to circle back to it here in a second, but I, this is definitely why people hate the movie. Uh, that and, <laughs> I mean, I never got caught up in it but when I was reading reviews, like the logistics of it. You know, I, I didn't. I was never really bothered by it. You know, he could have brought a ladder. He tested it. He did. A, they spent so much time with him testing it that. I was okay with them ending up in the hole and him getting out of it and them being laying, you know, all that was, I I didn't have a problem with it, but people did. 
Uh, people had a problem with the family forgiving him at the end. Uh, and you don't know what you would do in that situation. No. What are you supposed to do? Take him to take him to the police. Say he put us in a hole for a week. People like, had a hard is- time with the when the police came and they just kind of seemed to give up on it. Uh, and again, I, I they're not wrong, but it didn't bother me. Yeah, uh, that's just what I read in bad reviews. The good reviews, other than yours, left out that whole sub story, <laughs> which frustrated the hell out of me. I, in you know, there I've been reading ideas, and none of the ideas make sense. Uh, that oh, it's really the mom and or the daughter, and she's going to do it to her kid. But I'm like, they have different names. That would just be stupid. I mean, that's that's lazy guessing right there. Uh, the fact that John's story never really happened, and the mom's. I don't know. That doesn't make sense either or hold water. And if that were the case, that actually kind of makes me dislike the movie. But back to your idea, I, I think I have a take on what you were saying. If the parents are God and the family and he betrayed them and they still forgave him at the end, that makes more sense to me. And she's also the mom in the sub story is not just reading John on the whole. She's reading the story about the gardener. She's there's different stories. She's telling the girl, which would be like the Bible, then you're out on your own. So I can totally get behind that. And that actually is pretty cool and makes me like it even more. Uh, I do like the idea, too, though, of, you know, when you're 20 or whatever age you are, when you finally go into adulthood, the first thing you do, they always talk about the college kids because they gain the, gain the freshman 15. You go, you do whatever the fuck you want, eat whatever you want, uh, and at some point, most of us get to the point where we are like, okay, we can't keep this up. We need to grow up. And you can, by the way, this kid, just by the meals he makes, uh, you can see the progression of, of him dealing with his adolescence into a gr- to being a grown up. The reason they're in there is because he wants to know what it's like to be a grown up. He's constantly searching for that answer. He's asking his mom. He's asking the neighbor. Uh, and the way they do it is the tension and the, the level of creepiness is so perfect. The way they deliver both scenes where they talk about that. And it's just neat how, you know, he really nails just, you know, the way we were when we first became adults. Really, everybody. Some of us <laughs> yeah. never grow up. <laughs> and we That's keep true. eating chicken nuggets forever. <laughs> but when he goes and makes the what, risotto or whatever the hell it risotto, was. Yeah. Risotto, yeah. Risotto. That and then he goes back because he's so excited to show his family. They have and it's, I totally bought it. And when you throw this religion Bible thing in there, I, I, I think it fits and it it makes enough sense where it wouldn't make me turn on the movie. Uh, to me, it's not quite the suitcase and Pulp Fiction. You know, I need a little more than just that. Right. Uh, but I, I think he does have a point, and I think it does make sense, and I. And I'm uh, now it, it's got bad reviews, and I think in a way it's kind of like he didn't care, and that's pretty awesome. You know, he was pretty. You know, Ari Aster when he did Hereditary, he knew he was going to lose half the audience when he made that when he went towards the last act, and Very he didn't true. give a fuck. And yeah. I, I love that about this movie because there's definitely an element of I don't. This is my movie. I'm going whether you can come with me or not. <laughs> and most people haven't but yeah uh no, that's our that's our favorite kind of filmmaker is is that uh that visionary type and just want to circle back on something you just said about about john's motivation and and the fact that it could be as simple as just an experiment in adulthood just it, it makes it it makes what happens in this movie that much more terrifying and weird and scary in many ways and you know it, it's funny it's like when you think about what he does while his parents are gone, he's basically doing what you did if you got the house to yourself for a weekend, you know? I mean, and in any other way, like, this could be... He's like a Home Alone character. Like, he's, he's Macaulay Culkin, but it, but it's framed in such a way that, it, that it's terrifying. <laughs> this is a terrifying thing because he's put his family in a hole. He, this a child put his family in a fucking hole and left them there. And that is in the back of your head the entire time. Like, if there was any moment where you could try to enjoy what he's doing, you can't because the entire time in the back of your head, his family's in a fucking hole. <laughs> yeah. 
And if you go back to the biblical stuff, it even makes more sense. Like he's driving around as a 13 year old. Of course he's going to get pulled over, but not in the Bible. Think of all those fucking crazy stories that don't make any sense. You know, the floods being 600 years old, all that yeah. almost even adds another element to this that I'm just like, oh, wow, this is even more of a fuck you to the audience. <laughs> and I'm just pretty awesome. Or to a certain element of the audience. Yeah. Yeah. The more and more I, I mean, that really makes me like it even more. And I liked it quite a bit. And the one thing that would made me not like it is if I found out it was something as stupid as, oh, that was her in a past life or something like that. <laughs> that would take me out of it. Yeah, uh, but I, 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 I don't think he would do something that lame, that uh, direct predictable. Or, yeah, or not predictable, but you know what I mean. The uh, just, just basic. That I whole guess. the whole inclusion of that is just so weird. There's no explanation for it. There's no attempt to integrate it uh, to to this to this other story, the John John story, and that leads me to believe that that is a fully intentional act on his part to create this this uh, dissonance between those two things that they don't seem to connect, but you can, you're going to have to figure out how they connect if you want to. Right. Yeah. I'm, I think I'm sold on it. And what is it? Three different scenes. One kind of early on one in the middle and the very end. Is that kind of how they, where they break? I think off? so. I think I so. I can't remember if the one at the end is two full scene is I'm breaking. I don't know, but it, it, it see this movie and let us know what you think. Uh, I think not I'm, for everybody, but that's why we love it. <laughs> but if you're listening to, I mean, even critics. So that's the bummer is they're split 50, 50 on this. It's not just like yeah. the audience hates it and the critics love it. It's if you're, if you're sitting there demanding to know how he got them in the hole, you're watching the wrong movie. <laughs> and I think he does a good enough job of setting that up. But And again, when you throw this biblical aspect of it, which I really think is right, it has to be. Because it makes so much sense in so many different ways, uh, yeah. I, I, I bought. I, it never took me out of the movie. Uh, I mean, the, the God's Eye effect. I mean, literally, right in the poster we're looking at on, on YouTube, it's a photo looking upwards to the sky. And John, uh, in many scenes, is it, it, when he's at the hole. John is seen from that perspective the entire time. That God's Eye perspective. And John was that an has apostle. to be intentional. John was an apostle. Yeah. And then just the idea of a plot hole and having a hole in the title. <laughs> it's also kind of a genius, too. <laughs> so I, I, on so many levels, this, he's, uh, this is going to be a hell of a director someday. Well, you know, not, he already is, but I'm, I'm, yeah. I can't wait to see what else he does because this is really smart. Yeah, I agree. And I still don't have it all down, but it's just makes i i want to know more and it's that's a great that's a sign of a great filmmaker all right speaking of great filmmakers the green knight the green knight uh, from director david lowry starring uh dev patel as a uh, a knight uh, not a knight but a, a member of uh king arthur's court uh, he is the uh, the king arthur's nephew and uh he's not a guy who's really noble he's not somebody who has anything uh, about him that is special other than being the uh, cousin or the, the the nephew of King Arthur. That's basically the entire thing about him. And that's really established incredibly well in this brilliant scene where the king has uh, Patel's character come and sit next to him uh, at this at this round table Christmas celebration. And he asks him, tell me a story about your life. And he has no story to tell because he's this vacant, empty vessel of a person who is not done anything in his life and he patel registers that so beautifully wordlessly this this torturous notion that oh my god i've never i've not accomplished anything in my entire life and it's a devastating moment wordless it's gorgeous it's beautiful i just i i have no story to tell (laughs) that's just oh man wow he's just revealed himself so beautifully that was the moment i knew that i was really really into something on this movie was that moment uh from there uh in walks the green knight who uh, challenges king arthur's court uh to if anybody can land a blow on my neck uh uh i uh I, just, the challenge is not important the bottom line is that it, he challenges them and in one year he'll return and return that challenge uh nobody steps up until the king decides he himself will step up 
and then Dev Patel steps in in his place. And he takes it and he actually cuts off the, the Green Knight's head. The Green Knight then picks up his head and explains that in one year, I get my turn to land a blow on your neck. And it's basically just telling him one year from now, you're going to die. And from there, we set up this sort of uh, series of short films, uh, essentially, that are going to unfold as he uh, lives out this year. He starts off by not doing anything, by not dealing with this at all, like by taking this in and just being just paralyzed by terror until finally King Arthur forces him into action and says, you need to go face this. And with just a, maybe, a, I don't know, a month or so to go before this year is up, he begins to make this pilgrimage to the to the green church where he, he's going to meet the green knight and and have this encounter and potentially die along the way he has these uh in, encounters there's a, a a character who is a, a thief who is in a field with a bunch of dead bodies just robbing everybody and that encounter is a terrifying situation where he nearly dies and you seemingly see him die in a way and the, the symbolism Surrounding it, Barry Keegan is in that ser- sequence, and Barry Keegan is one of the most unpredictable, fascinating actors in the world. Um, and, you know, the, his characters are so similar, and yet still he's so unpredictable. That's really amazing. He brought this the same quality that he brought to the killing of a sacred deer he brings to this character. Um, my, my favorite part of the entire movie, my favorite of these sequences, uh, he goes to this cottage in the woods in the middle of the night looking for a place to stay. He lays down in a bed. A woman who of a seemingly royal breeding comes in and says, you're sleeping in my bed. And he attempts to leave and she says, she stops him and says, will you help me find my head? And it's just your, your reaction, his reaction is all the same when she says that. And then he actually helps her find her head and we come to find out why she's there and who she is and who what a sequence what a sequence it's so very very good um the the final sequence has him in a in a uh, a castle uh joel edgerton is a uh, i think a, a knight or someone of royal breeding who invites him into his home and there's a woman there who is also i mean the same actress is playing uh his love interest back when he was in arthur's court but that's not acknowledged in any way. So it's kind of just us in this sort of dissonant feeling like it's the same. <laughs> it's really good. So then uh, that encounter happens and that's what's leading him towards the green Knight. But then there's a whole other thing that happens. And when we get to this ending, that is just perfect. It is such a perfect way to end this movie. Uh, Ralph Ineson from uh, game of Thrones plays the green Knight, And the way he says one line at the end of this movie is so good it's <laughs> so good that it is actually the linchpin for me for this entire movie just the the choice of how he chose to right. say this line is so good that's why i love this movie it ties everything together so perfectly <laughs> uh yeah it, this was just i'm not a sword and sandal guy at all and Knowing A24 was going to do one, I was like, okay, I mean, it's A24, so I'll give it a shot, but it's the guided ghost story. A lot of people love that movie. I've never seen it. I just, going off you and Josh, probably should see it. <laughs> uh, and, but it was like, you know, why not? We haven't been, I don't get to go to the theater much. And it was just from opening scene, it was just right on. Jesus Christ. Sorry. If you can hear piano Sorry. in the background. <laughs> My family just got back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, I, I from the first scene to the end, it was just like this is a perfect movie. I don't get to see movies like this. I don't get to see movies like this in the big screen. Uh, why doesn't every movie have to? Why can't every movie be like this? <laughs> you know, it it's so absorbing the the look of the movie, the the feel of it, the 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 way he he's essentially taking a genre film, the sword and sandals genre, you know, knight's quest movie and and completely updating how this is done. You know, in, in the past, a movie like this is done on, a, on this massively epic scale with these massive sets and these millions of extras and just the, the, all this money poured into recreating this period. And he's done that on a scale that is like 
five million times less than right. what anybody's done it before. And he's completely reinvented how you do it by turning it into this dream of history. Uh, and that's what this is. It is a dream like remembrance of what something like this could have been like, because obviously nobody has any real notion of what this really would have been like at that time. Uh, and, and so it's a kind of, it's a recreation of that entire genre in, in David Lowry's image. And, and it's just, unbelievable from that perspective the way he's taken something that is so familiar and given it this whole uh, whole new vibe this whole refreshing vibe uh i never thought i would like another one of these movies like i hate gladiator like i'm a, <laughs> not somebody who's built to enjoy a movie like this and i he took that and turns that into something so much more tangible to me it feels yes. so much more relatable and and it, it as as outsized as it is there are giants in this movie you know, there's magic in this movie but it feels tangible it feels kind of almost lived in in a way yeah and when he goes to meet his fate there's this like last temptation of the christ act after that you know where he kind of gets to go back and re you know relive what his future would be and i was just i, I thought that was really cool uh, the, just adding that part in there and how <laughs> this empty vessel can't outrun himself. You know, he can't outrun his, him being, you know, an empty vessel or yeah. a fuck up, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's just, I don't know. It, it's impressive. And uh, are we going to talk about his blankie or whatever the hell this safety net is? <laughs> Cause that, <laughs> That thing uh, is such an important part of this movie. So his mother is a witch who raised, uh, essentially used magic to bring about, I guess, the Green Knight. And when she knows that her son is the one who has confronted the Green Knight, she decides to try and protect him using magic. She creates this sash for him to wear that has a, a magic in it that can uh, prevent him from dying. Uh, this uh, he immediately then loses this, gets it back in a fashion that is so <laughs> bizarre <laughs> and so amazing yeah. <laughs> how he gets this back and how Joel Edgerton asks him to then return it to him in a way <laughs> that is so amazing. And again, so revealing of the emptiness within this character uh, he can he cannot experience joy in any real way. Like he just can't. And this is so reflective. This thing, this sash that, that prevents him from dying, it also prevents him from living. I know that sounds kind of cheesy when you say it like that, but honestly, truly, <laughs> that is how this uh ends up playing out. And it, it's so powerful. The, the the image of him removing the sash in the end of that dream sequence and his head just falling to the ground. Uh, is yeah, it's picture perfect. It is just so spectacular. Um, yeah, and then then uh, after that, then of course comes the real ending and the and the genius of Ralph Ineson's uh, delivery. No, just f from beginning to end, just a perfect movie. So well thought out, every shot. I mean, every frame could be a, a framed picture on your wall. Yeah, uh, it's just. Uh, I just loved it. It's and I don't. Maybe it is the fact that it's not a movie I would normally like, and he brought it. You know, made me like it. You know, when it's like I'm not a fan of musicals, but when something like La La Land comes out, and you're like, you kind of like it more than you normally would a normal movie. And maybe it's the same kind of thing, but I, I don't know. I think the the artistic level is just so good here that no matter what, I, I would have loved this movie. I, I just. Everybody should see this one. I, again, it's probably not for everybody, but it should be. It disappoints me that it's not. Uh, this is this is visionary on every level. He has Lowry is, exp is has has so much control over every aspect from uh, you know not just the the script and the and the scene, but the dialogue. You know, the dialogue is, is precise, and and every every piece of dialogue ha has a point and purpose to to these scenes and and to his story and developing everything that goes along. But also, you know, th even the the costuming, the 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 choice of where to put each story as he as he experiences them, he's ex he's exerting so much control over all of that, so much visionary control. That you can sense the, the the hand of a really great artist is leading you towards something incredible uh, throughout the entire movie, and 
I don't care if I'm overstating it. That's how I felt. <laughs> that is definitely how I felt that I was in the hands of this incredible artist who is leading me towards something amazing. And then it arrives and it gives you something amazing at the end. And I, I just adore that. And I'm not even a Lowry guy. Like I, I liked old man in the gun. I liked Pete's dragon. I didn't enjoy ain't them body saints. And I didn't, and I really, really didn't enjoy ghost story. Like I found that movie to be uh, uh, tedious uh, Josh liked it. I didn't. Josh hated um, but, it too. Josh oh, liked he hated Pete, it too. He loved Pete's Dragon. Like I thought he liked. Pete, I thought he liked Ghost Story. No, no, some no. one of us liked Ghost. I hate because no. I know I hated Ghost Story. You guys both because that Josh was just talking to Uncle Jeff about okay. Ghost Story online and how much he didn't <laughs> like it either. Because uh, Uncle Jeff liked it though. Uh, yeah. No, I mean it gives. I, me, see, I found it tedious, but yeah. also I, what I understand about that movie is that it is again, it's a visionary director who is not taking time to worry about whether you're enjoying what he's doing. He's got a vision and he's sticking to it. And that, from that perspective, I can, I can get behind what he does in Ghost Story because it's a singular vision. He he's definitely doing something that is fully his own, and here's here's something he is doing that is fully his own once again. Yeah, just fantastic. And you mentioned something earlier about kind of the idea of being cheesy. A lot of this movie should be a cheesy movie, and that's kind of what our classic is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anything else on the Green Knight before we move on to that? This is uh, this is a, an amazing experience of a movie. It's one of the best movies of of this year and the last you know several years. And I'm I would be curious to revisit my A twenty four list and see where I put this. Oh yeah, it's. It'll be on the list for it's sure. not midsummer, but <laughs> midsummer no, is still midsummer. But <laughs> but it does what midsummer does on a different level, you know, on a yeah. little bit lower level, but still on a you know, it, it exposes Jungle Cruise as just another thing that exists in the world. <laughs> but it exposes good things too. That, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? There's good movies that aren't this. You know, I mean when. I mean, you remember when I saw Midsummer? It was up until Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I hated everything after that because it, <laughs> it wasn't Midsummer. And the Green Knight, if it wasn't for John in the Hole being a wholly original idea, I right. mean, this is part of why I didn't like Stillwater. You know, forget <laughs> pretend a man and X never existed, and that movie works and is great. This would have been like, why? Uh, who gives a fuck? You know, it's <laughs> you know, I love Spotlight at the time, but at the same, but in any year, that's like a. 10 to 15 on my list as opposed to in the top five because it would just have to be a weak year yeah you know you need <laughs> these movies the green knights the midsummers the all those a24 movies or a lot of them at least just make those movies look like eh, <laughs> just another hollywood you know oscar contender but there's also an accumulation factor, you know, the, the fact that we see so many movies that yes. uh, that uh, they just run together at a certain point when something does pop up like this or John in the Hole or Giants being lonely. They, they mm-hmm. stand out so much more and so much higher than the rest of the movies and they expose you know what's missing everywhere else. This is how people become film snobs. You see too many movies, you're going to end up becoming a film snob. It's inevitable. But you talk about you know it being a disposable culture, especially the last twenty years, or whatever. We keep going back. I mean, how many times have we done the A24 show? You know, we've <laughs> we've done that show five times at least. You know, where we did a list of some sort, whether we did an end of the year and just did A24 separately, or we did it, we've done something A24 by itself at least five times, if not more, because none of it's disposable to me, to you, to probably even Josh or anybody else who really gets into it with us. Mm-hmm. They're not disposable movies at all. And this is, I'm not going to forget this and I'm going to watch it again. <laughs> oh, yeah. I can't wait to watch this again. <laughs> yeah. So that, I don't know. And, I'll take it though. I don't mind. Call me a film snob. I don't really care. I'll watch yeah. these. And you know, we're getting into this Nicolas Cage thing, which is on a lower level, on a more indie level, I guess, than this. But I, still, those two are. It's just something I, I need originality. I'm getting sick of just paint by numbers. Even if it's good, it's still paint by numbers. Yeah. By by any other by any rational notion. Jungle Cruise is a good movie, but I don't care. <laughs> I don't care at all about Jungle Cruise. It's a thing that exists and it happened. And it's there to, you know, 
entertain uh, people who are on their phones the entire time. Like you're not going to be engaged by it. It is not going to be remember it the next day. But even like we've gone back and part of it's the culture we live in too, but we've gone back to movies we loved like old school or whatever. And I'm sure if we were to dig into some other ones that I, and I think the culture plays more of a role, but still movies like this (laughs) are kind of just like, okay, I don't need to have watched that. That doesn't need to be my go-to late night, go to sleep movie anymore. I, I, I need, I need originality in my life. I, it's kind of sick of the white. But you know what? Comedies. You're gonna in 20 years. You're not going to worry about watching the Green Knight again because you're going to just know that it's great. Whereas there are movies that we may have oh, liked yeah. as kids that just they they don't age well. And this is the kind of movie that is going to te- stand the test of time. We're not going to find out in 15 years that something like <laughs> this was actually a neo-Nazi movie or something right. like this. Well, and, you know, you look at movies like Old School and Hangover or whatever. And not that I, I mean, I haven't watched Hangover. Maybe Hangover is still, Hangover is still great. But I watched it a lot in that first year or two. But then I stopped because yeah. then another movie came out and I watched that a lot and I stopped. I'm going to probably watch this every year for a long time or every couple of years for a long time. I'm going to I watch all the mid, the not all of them, but a lot of the A24 movies a lot over and over again. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Just well done. A24. Keep doing it. Yes. This movie is incredible. You've done an amazing thing and, and uh, just keep doing what you do, please forever and ever. All right, and our classic is not Monty Python and the Holy <laughs> Grail, <laughs> but it might as well have been. <laughs> was this a comedy? Monty Python. Yeah. I know, but was this a comedy? <laughs> no, because I this was serious. it felt like a parody the whole time. It really did. It's so awful. Um, so I was looking for something to relate to the Green Knight somehow, and this is the same story as the Green Knight. This is Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Uh, t- Sean Connery is the Green Knight, the same Green Knight that is in the Green Knight. Um, and Miles O'Keefe, what is with that haircut? I mean, who thought that was a good idea? I mean, it looks like it should be the Princess Bride. That's how goofy the <laughs> characters are. Are they look? Uh, it's the, I mean, that's the same haircut that the guy in Spaceballs wore. I mean, right. when he played uh, <laughs> Prince Valium. <laughs> I, this movie is is supremely dumb, but it's telling. It's it's, ama- it's an amazing kind of a film school moment when you look at how two different people can take the same material and make something so completely different. You've got this transcendent work of art in the green Knight and the hands of David Lowry. And then you've got this in the hands of whoever did this. And it just goes to show you just that, uh, that just different people see things in a very different ways. Um, there's a lot of similar elements. There's not a lot of similar elements in terms of just the very basic story. I'm saying not the, not in the style or anything like that, but they're telling the same ancient tale. Like they're both inspired by the same story and they come out in completely different ways, but we still have the green knight confronting Gawain and Gawain cutting off his head and him picking up his head and putting it back on and uh, telling him that he'll, you know, he'll kill him in one year and they're going to confront each other. And and it plays out from there. He goes on a knight's quest and ends up, you know, facing off and and so on and meets a beautiful woman at a certain point uh, who kind of becomes a love interest, which now that, that doesn't really happen in the Green Knight. There's no there's a love interest per se. But she's meant more to show how empty his life is. Right. <laughs> and that's such a she's she's there for her. the characters in this movie have no purpose. They they are enacting. Um, you know, the very, the, this is the very definition of just taking it from the page to the screen with no, with no attempt to, to at depth or, or anything. You're just enacting what was in front of you. This is what I'm told to do. I'm supposed to hit this mark and do this thing. Very obviously, that's what I do. Okay, move on. Next scene. Uh, Sean Connery's completely checked out to a point of absolute hilarity. Like he's certainly enjoying himself. You know, he's he's jerking off all over the screen. He's enjoying himself, but he's not doing anything for anybody else. You can see almost the the complete disdain he has for everyone around him, especially Miles O'Keefe. 
I mean, it almost was like they're making it for kids, which is, <laughs> and maybe it was, I mean, I was only like, what was this, 82? So I'd have been like three when it came yeah. out. Uh, so, I, I mean, I was too young. Except for there's it. a beheading in this movie where a guy is beheaded and puts his own head back on. Yeah, but it's played so cartoony. <laughs> And I don't know when Monty Python and the Holy Grail came out, but it make I want to believe it came out after this, and they just no. I think it was. I thought that was seventy four. Probably was. was late seventies. This is eighty three. Which so. makes this even worse. Because <laughs> you knew that. Yeah, you knew that that was in the world. That, but you still made this right. <laughs> like I could see watching this movie, like well, we'll just act just like them and make it a comedy. <laughs> <laughs> But if if it if that was in the world, and you're right, I think it was in the 70s. Which I mean, in many ways, you know, the Princess Bride could have taken some of this story and like and, and done that. And they played it the same. I mean, they it, it flowed just like the Monty Python movie, just like Princess Bride. I thought I could not tell if it was a parody or not. <laughs> Only, I mean. Uh, and the only way the only way I can sense that this wasn't a parody is that I don't think Miles O'Keefe is an actor capable of that level of parody because I just don't think like he's so bad it's hard to believe that anybody could be that bad intentionally. Yeah, <laughs> you just it, you you happen upon that level of bad. You don't actually you don't actually are that bad. It's it's Wissowian in its way. You don't know what you're doing is wrong. You're just, but you're doing it anyway. <laughs> And it's a long movie too. It's not like it goes on for a while. Yeah, I it, I saw this before the Green Knight too, uh, so uh, yeah, I, I just it's free on Tubi. <laughs> yeah, don't save your save your free money uh, and just watch commercials. <laughs> <laughs> Watch a blank screen for the same amount of time, and you'll be just as enriched. Yeah, and let a, com- a commercial pop up every couple minutes. <laughs> and yeah, it was bad. Uh, but that is our show. We went over the 91 movies. Next week, we've got uh, Don't Breathe 2, Free Guy, Respect, Homeroom, the uh, movie on Hulu, Beckett with John David Washington on Netflix, a movie called Coda. And then uh, the Val Kilmer documentary on Amazon. I think it's already out now, actually. I think so, too. But we're going to do it anyway. Yeah. And the classic's going to be Real Genius. And there's three movies from 91. The Commitments, Mystery Date, Woman and Men 2. I must have really been a... I'd have never even heard of those movies. Maybe I saw the posters. <laughs> I'd know what they were. Uh, we're not abandoning the premise of 91 movies. It's just a week. It, it's 91's not a great year. <laughs> it's not no. uh, also next week. I'm going to talk about a movie called Materna, which I've actually got uh, two pieces on that are out right now. Uh, I, I don't think it's a good movie, but I think there are so many good things about it, but uh, there's some things that are just, there's some choices made in that movie that are very off. And uh, like I said, I wrote a 2000 word essay on the visual filmmaking of this movie that, where it goes wrong, the choices that they made that I think kind of sink the movie. But at the same time, it has the it has the look of a guy who could make a John in the hole or could make an A24 movie. So it makes Materna out something that I'm fascinated by and hopeful about. And so I'll talk a little bit more about that next week. And also, I'm watching a, a really fascinating documentary from IFC called The Meaning of Hitler, which is exploring uh, Hitler essentially how how Hitler is seen today and trying to figure out a way to force people to kind of you know grab you by your shoulders and remind you he's he was real he did this stuff he was evil don't forget and you know as often as we see Hitler being tossed around as a as a pejorative you know towards Trump or towards you know you it, it, that type of thing is I understand where you're coming from. At the same time, you 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 don't realize that you're dampening the impact of saying the saying his name and remembering what he did, and that makes this documentary so interesting. Yeah, is that going to be available? Yes, that'll be uh, streaming on demand as of Friday. Awesome. And Materna is available now. Uh, it's available to stream anytime, anytime anybody wants right now. So. I, I do think there there's something to see in Materna, but uh, there's also, like I said, a good deal that I don't think is good enough. 
Yeah, and I'm trying to decide how off how comfortable I am in the theaters. <laughs> We've had some vax people get COVID at work, and not that I'm I'm because I'm vaccinated. I'm not worried about because the vaccine right, keeps you out got of the a hospital. Child who can't get- yeah, you've got a child who can't get vaccinated, right? And it, and I have friends. I have uh, some people with cancer. I got some other a friend of my son's is going through chemo, so he can't get vaccinated and little things like that. Plus, but I'm not worried about me because I got the vaccine. I'll you know keep me out of the hospital, keep me from dying most likely. Uh, that's what it's there for. Everybody that I know that has the vaccine and got COVID is fine. Uh, so. It's not there to keep you from getting it. It's there to keep you out of the hospital <laughs> if you get it. Yes. Uh, but whatever. Uh, off my soapbox. All right. Quick. <laughs> we are running a little long, but let's, unless you need to get going. No, I'm, I'm good. Run a quick round of flick chart until we get something funny. If it's right off the bat, then we'll just end it early. <laughs> I'm not letting you do that one. I know it's funny, but. <laughs> <laughs> Girl interrupted Spartacus. Girl interrupted. Yeah. Spartacus is great, but after you see the Green Knight, it's kind of like, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was Kubrick as a director for hire, right? Yeah. It wasn't really. Uh, yeah. Still an epic in many ways. Oh, yeah. I, I, I get it. But, as good yeah. as it could have been for what they were trying to do, but yeah. Girl Interrupted was a better movie. Is this uh, a that movie? Batman and Robin, I'm, I'm not sure what that is. I think good. it's a serial. <laughs> The Shootist, The Descendants. The Descendants for me. I agree. Never been a big John Wayne fan. Don't yeah, look. Don't, I, we don't should look. probably. <laughs> Go ahead. We should probably be looking into to them at some point, but yeah, there's no been no good reason to. Don't love him. Don't like Elvis. Don't like Babe Ruth. I don't know. <laughs> Just me. Oh, that reminds me. There's another documentary um, called The Faithful. Uh, that I wasn't sure if we're going to talk about or not next week because I'm not sure about its release. It's very, very independent, but it's a, a documentary uh, by a woman who who is dealing with grief. She lost a very important family member, and in the midst of that, she goes on this journey to Italy to to the Vatican, and this is in the time of Pope John Paul, and she sees all of this ludicrous you know, stuff dedicated to Pope John Paul to the point where they can Pope John Paul lollipop. You know, he's on his face is everywhere on all these products. And that reminded her of, of her trip to Nashville where she saw Elvis and she went to Graceland and she saw all these people gathering to mourn him. And then Pope John Paul dies and people gather to mourn him. And she gets into this thing about grief and the way this mass exposure of grief. And that brings her also to Princess Di who passes away in the process of her making these you know, observations about death. And she brings all these three together, put the princess die Elvis and the Pope uh, together while also on her own grief journey. It's really, really fascinating. But the, the availability of that one is a little bit hard. It is available. I think if you, if you want to do a virtual screening on Friday or Saturday and from New York city, uh, it's gotcha. 10 bucks. But it's not something that's very easy to find. Gotcha. But it's uh, called The Faithful, if anybody wants to look into it. All right. Twilight or Dark Man? <sighs> Twilight? Really? I'm going to go Dark I think Man. Dark Man's kind of a piece of shit. I do too, but it's Sam Raimi. Not that Twilight's not a piece of yeah. shit, but I just don't care either way. Fishing with Gandhi. <laughs> <laughs> Dark Man wins. I always win the impor- less important coin flips. Super 8, Aaron Brockovich. Super 8. I'll go Aaron Brockovich. I won again. <laughs> Sherlock Holmes, A Game of Shadows, Four Rooms. Sherlock Holmes? I just don't think Four, four Rooms comes together. Not that shows. Sherlock Holmes comes together all that well, but it, 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 well enough, I guess. It's entertaining enough. Robert Downey Jr. is fun. Yeah. Scent of a Woman, Howard the Duck. Howard the Duck. It's far more memorable than Scent of a Woman. I hate Scent of a Woman. That's what I remember about it is just hating it. Yeah, just wait till next year. Grown Ups and American in Paris. An American in Paris. Intolerable Cruelty, Super Troopers. I think Intolerable Cruelty is really underrated. I think that movie is actually pretty funny and, and 
Clooney, Clooney's can, uh, his his chemistry with her is just phenomenal. Yeah. Flags of Our Fathers, Finding Dory. Finding Dory. Yeah. Flags of Our Fathers is fine, but it's not. Right. Uh, Finding Dory is more moving. Zombie Land, The Last Starfighter. Zombie Land. Agreed. Deadpool, The Bodyguard. <laughs> Deadpool. Yep. Prisoners, 27 Dresses. This shouldn't be hard for me, <laughs> but it kind of is because I kind of love 27 Dresses. It's just one of those real sweet comfort movies. Prisoners. Prisoners <laughs> is the choice, but I I do have a big soft spot in the same way. Not It's not nearly as good as Legally Blind, but it has a similar feel to it in that comfort food kind of movie. So, But Prisoners is the choice. Is that the one that uh, the guy did Dunes did? Yeah. Uh, I need to rewatch that because I did not like it the first time I saw it. And I like everything else he's done. So I'm sure I'm wrong. <laughs> All the President's Men, House of Flying Daggers. That's another tough one, man, because House of Flying Daggers is gorgeous. Um, let me go All the President's Men because I think it's, it's more meaningful. But House of Flying Daggers is an amazing movie. Even overcoming my hatred of Dustin Hoffman. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, That's the, how good all the president's been. Is it makes me not hate Dustin Hoffman if we don't roll for once. But this is the one. What's one of those back to you know? You got your Green Knight, and then you got your standard movie. But you're right; it's it's a really good one. Uh, anyway, the Bone Collector. He knows you're alone. He knows you're alone is better just because it has that one line. <laughs> the, the, is that the one with the call coming from inside the house? I have no idea. <laughs> Swingers the Fighter. Swingers, because the it's more memorable than the fighter. I yeah. think I know I liked the fighter, but I can recall Swingers. And I'm gonna put Swingers on before the fighter. I did like it a lot. I've watched it more than once, but Swingers is I like that indie spear a little better. One Night Stand E.T. I've never seen One Night Stand, or at least I don't think I have. I have not either. <sighs> Alien vs. Predator, Requiem, E.T. E.T. I don't love E.T., but E.T. is better than that movie. The Philadelphia Story, Moving. Philadelphia Story, by a lot. (laughs) The Hot Chick, Gladiator. There we go. (laughs) Fuck you. Gladiator wins. (sighs) Green Lantern, The Cider House Rules. Oh, for fuck's sake! (laughs) Green Lantern. Fuck the Cider House rules. Really? I hate the Cider House rules. I think that movie is such a piece of shit. It's an even bigger piece. I would watch Green Lantern 15 times before I watch that fucking Cider House rules shit. I like Ryan Reynolds, (laughs) so even though the movie At least it's got that going for it. Yeah, you're right. (laughs) There's nothing going for it. Even Charlize Theron can't make that fucking piece of shit watchable. (laughs) At least she has that brief nude scene. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Deadpool, Dog Day Afternoon. Dog Day Afternoon is incredible, but Deadpool is hilarious. So I got to pick Deadpool. Yeah, I agree. Gothica made Manhattan. Gothica. Gothica is a piece of shit, but it's, <laughs> it smells less than made in Manhattan. <laughs> yes. Star Trek Generations, House of Flying Daggers. House of Flying Daggers. Yes. Eraserhead, the Mexican. Fishing with Gandhi. Yeah, <laughs> I'll go raise her head because I'm supposed to like it. I I tried reading his book or listening yeah. to the audiobook, and basically what a razor head's about is nothing that's on the screen. It's <laughs> it's like him afraid of having a kid. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I yeah I don't know. Uh, District Nine, the Great Saint Tree. Never heard of that okay. second one. Snowpiercer, District 9. Yes, Snowpiercer. Yeah, I agree. Lost in Translation, Kiss the Girls. Lost in Translation. Absolutely. People Under the Stairs, Creed. Creed. Creed, About Time, Jingle All the Way. About Time. 
Battle Royale, Dr. Doolittle. <laughs> I want to combine those movies so bad. Let's have Eddie Battle Murphy's Royale. characters fight each other to the death. <laughs> the... Uh, no, I just want to watch everybody, Dr. Doolittle, get murdered <laughs> just violently and viciously. Put John, put them all in a hole. <laughs> All right, we're not oh, going to get shit. anything good. So let's we're going to call the show right there. <laughs> All, right, good. All right, talk to everybody later. Bye. Cool.